Okay, welcome. Uh, they put me first day because I was told I'm supposed to wake everyone up. Um, Tradition-wise, I want to um, uh, demonstrate something for you guys. This is called a camera. Uh, you might have seen these in museums. You cannot make a phone call with it. But it's the only way to do a true selfie. Anyway, um, if you don't know who I am, my name's Steve Rosted. I'm uh, uh, started uh, kernel development. Actually, I'm like a really real, real newbie because I found out uh, anything before ni starting Linux development before '93. You're really a newbie. <laughs> uh, I didn't. I first heard of Linux in '98. Uh, no, '96. '96 when I was actually trying to. I had this task where I was working on. Uh, developing something on Visual C++. And I just came from the AIX world. And I, uh, as I'm working, I found out I ended up debugging the debugger. And I was so frustrated, I screamed, can't they make a Linux, or no, sorry, can't they make a Unix for the PC? And this intern sitting next to me says, have you heard of Linux? I'm like, what? So I download the 13, C, uh, 13 diskettes of Slackware, and off I, here I am. Um, but I did start actually doing kernel development in 98 for my master's. And in 2001, was, I got hired by TimeSys uh, to do, port their real-time Linux kernel uh, to embedded devices. So, that's, so the embedded world is actually where I started. And although I don't really do embedded today, um, I've always had a soft spot for embedded. In fact, a lot of times pe embedded folks have told me, you know, thank you, we like you because you actually care about us. And it's because I miss it, <laughs> so because I don't get the chance to do as much embedded stuff as I used to, and you know, you guys get to all the fun. Anyway, back to my talk. So I'm talking about the preempt RT patch. Um, like I said, I worked for TimeSys, and then I became a contractor, and I worked for Siemens in Germany. And while there in Germany uh, in 2003, um, they wanted to get away from the TimeSys proprietary, you know, modules and everything, and they wanted a free real-time Linux kernel. So instead of just writing my own in 2004, I was searching around to see is anyone else doing it. And I came across this patch set from Ingo Molnar. And I started working on top of that, and I'm like, this is awesome. So then I worked with Thomas Gleichner, and um, it's funny because uh, every time on Linux Weekly News, everyone, how many people here have a subscription to Linux Weekly News, lwn.net? How many people don't? Get one. It's awesome. It's the best news source for the Linux kernel at all. And actually, most of Linux, anything that deals with Linux, it's the best community-driven. Jonathan Corbett, I think he's going to be here, uh, who basically runs LWN. Awesome. Anyway, he always used to say, you know, the preempt or the real-time patch by Ingo Molnar, Thomas Gleichner, and others. And that's what he always said, the real-time patch, Ingo Molnar, Thomas Gleichner, and others. Hey, everyone. I'm others. <laughs> so... Uh, anyway, uh, in 2004, we started getting, doing a lot of stuff, and to make the Linux become real-time, it has to be of some quality. So we did a lot of work. Most of our work was actually making Linux better. Um, before, I forgot what year it was, but there was no such thing as a mutex inside the kernel. It was all semaphores. And most, pretty much 98% of all semaphores had one owner. Now, if we wanted prior priority inheritance, you need to have an actual designated owner to a lock to do the priority inheritance, and you couldn't do that with semaphores. So we introduced mutex. So that mutex lock you see in the kernel, that came from us. Um, we did lock depth, because we kept hitting things so much. Um, it was really interesting, because the real-time kernel uh, preempts spin locks, where normal kernel, that's, you know, you can't really preempt a spin lock, but in real time, we don't do spinning. We actually sleep. So what we would do is we would trigger off, if you had a 1,000 threads, you're actually simulating a machine with 1,000 CPUs. And even though you had one CPU in 2004 or 2005, where we had the real-time Linux running, we were able to trigger deadlocks that, oh, that took at least six to seven, sometimes eight CPUs to trigger. And I remember Andrew Morton goes, did you actually trigger this, or did you find this from you know, inspection? I said, no, I triggered it within about an hour. 
And he's like, how? And basically it re required like, actually at that time it was six different things had to happen before that bug triggered, but it was a legitimate bug. Um, and it's the real-time patch. So that's one reason why today Linux scales so well on these large CPU machines is because of the real-time patch made it happen when you know, the average person had one, one CPU, one core. Uh, F-Trace came from it. Uh, I, that's actually, that's funny because I, I do mostly F-Trace. Everyone knows me about F-Trace. And I had my own tracer back in 98 when I worked on my thesis. I did F-Trace, or actually I did this, uh, it was called log dev, where it was an internal ring buffer to trace stuff. And then um, the real-time patch had its, uh, from Ingo Molnar and someone else that came and uh, developed this uh, latency tracer. So I merged the two, because we're trying to get everything upstream, and people are saying, could you get this latency tracer upstream? So I took the latency tracer, I took my log dev, put it together, and this is what eventually became F-Trace. I said, it's gonna be a three-month project so I can work on the next thing to get into mainline. F-Trace got in around 2007, 2008. I'm still working on it. That project took a little bit longer than three months. <laughs> and I'll talk about other things else. So. I love this topic because everyone says, you know, Linux isn't hard real time. You always have hear the term hard real time. And we've had lots of arguments with saying soft real time, hard real time. Linux today, without the real time patch, is legitimately soft real time. Soft real time allows for outliers as long as the majority uh, cases are not too many. So there's no guarantee a soft real time can still work, but you get really much real-time performance if you don't care about a few outliers here and there. Hard real-time means there's zero outliers. But when you say hard real-time from the embedded device, I worked at Lockheed Martin before all that. I was like going for my master's at Lockheed Martin, so I did actually real-time development there with you know, VxWorks and stuff. With hard real-time, we're more interested about correctness. Not about the, the actual missing outliers, but provable correctness, that you could prove that there will not be outliers. And you could actually look at the system, analyze it. It took years sometimes, and they're small little systems. Now, with Linux, it's so large. They say you can't prove it. Uh, there's work in kernel recipes. Uh, Daniel Brissett will be talking about uh, modeling, which is getting close to it. But you can't prove that the real-time patch Linux is hard real-time. Correct. So I like to call this we're hard real-time designed. You can't prove it, but every design decision we make we can show that this design um, is unbounded. What that time, when bounded time is, well, that, that's an exercise for you. Um, this allows us to be deterministic. I hate the term real time because there's real time this, real time that. It's so ambiguous term. Because uh, we, when I say real time, I mean deterministic. So when I say a real time operating system, I always say it's a deterministic operating system or DOS. Whoops. Ah. So, when will preempt RT be merged? Hmm, good question. Uh, back in 2008, uh, four years after the real-time patch started, uh, our pleasant editor, uh, name, I, won't give, I won't give his name, I already mentioned it, uh, said wild predictions of 2008. And in there, uh, in the article, it said, the merging of the real-time Linux tree will be substantially complete by the end of the year. You're, why are you laughing? <laughs> Your editor is out on a limb here. The remaining real-time code includes some of the most intrusive changes, changes, but distributors are shipping this code now and has been well tested in a number of environments. So it seems likely that by the end of 2008, the mainline Linux kernel will be fully capable of running in a real-time mode. Our pleasant editor turned to a grumpy one. And at the end of the year, wrote this, after he made two other predictions that were obviously correct. And he says, flush from those two obvious successes, your editor went off and stated that the bulk of the real-time tree would be merged into mainline kernel by the end of the year. Oh well. Your editor should know by now that expecting to de deterministic merges from, or merge times from real-time patches is sure path to disappointment. Latencies in this area are always high, higher than one would like. In this case, the real-time developers got stuck in a high-priority interrupt taking over the x86 um, architecture, which is a long story and could, could talk in itself, uh, with the result that the real-time work got preempted and suffered from severe starvation. So, being optimistic, as he was, but still grumpy, in January of 2009, he predicted this. The real-time patch set will be mostly merged by the end of the year. It really has to happen this time. What could possibly go wrong? 
No, this is 10 years ago. Oh well. 2010. Uh, the big kernel lock will be gone from the mainline kernel. Actually, it will probably remain in a number of places, but things will have reached to a point where lock kernel call is an indication of old, unmaintained, and unusable code. On any reasonable current hardware, a leading edge kernel will be able to run with no big kernel lock use at all. This work will, this wor work will be part of a larger job of getting the real-time preemption patch set into mainline, but your editor dares not attempt another prediction of when that task will be complete. 2019, that's the commit in Linux mainline tree. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Here's the commit that of the, the change. Depends on ARC supports RT. No architecture defines this. <laughs> so yes, real time is in the kernel. You just can't enable it. Uh, this was actually to show that you know a lot of people were starting to make decisions on whether or not to support real time or not. And they're saying, you know, it's been 10 years, guys. I, I'm starting to think that this isn't going to happen. So we are saying we are really almost there. And it's basically, you know, the real time folks are actually a little bit anal on this because we actually will not push hacks into the kernel. Uh, there are several hacks that work that would, in a proprietary software company, would just definitely ship it with it, uh, because no one would know. But w there's a lot of hacks that we do to force determinism that really on a non, that we modify a uh, non-real-time kernel, uh, basically sacrifice the non-real-time kernel, we actually, to get real-time going on, because real-time does add performance overhead and such, and we had to make changes that we don't, we we're not comfortable with forcing on to others. So we're working, that's why the real-time patch is basically done. It's basically doing it properly that our, the real-time code works well with upstream. That's really what we're working on fixing. Anyway, once it does get in, I'm thinking about 2020. <coughs> no, 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 no. Well, it's, it's pretty much there. We, we do have everything done. It's, it's basically ready. So first thing you need to do is when you get, do get it, I'm going to talk about what do you do. So if you want real time, the first thing you do is you go up, uh, show your make menu config, and find uh, the config preempt RT full. And this is in, uh, I think it's uh, general configuration, or it's in kernel configuration or something like a general setup. And right now, don't worry about it. This is actually, if you download the patch today, this is the screenshot of today's uh, kernel, which is what, 5214RT. And uh, we, we are not, the mainline kernel won't, will not have uh, the two, it won't be called you know, basic RT and then RT full. The basic RT was a way to do testing. Uh, the make we disabled some options to see if we got some parts right, but that's not going upstream. So it'll be called config preempt RT, not config, config preempt RT full, but if you download the patch today, it's config preempt RT full that you want. Um, optionally, you could do no, no hertz full, uh, which I'm going to talk about later uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, this is kind of strange because you can actually download and install the real-time patch but not enable high-resolution timers. I don't know why you want to do that, but, <laughs> but maybe there's a use case. And I, always, I gave a talk at kernel, or Embedded Recipes, I think last year or maybe the year before, about you know the real-time is more than just a kernel. And I talked about the system, and if you want to analyze the system, you want to enable the hardware latency tracer that detects hardware latencies. And I'll talk a little bit about this later. And the sked tracer, which doesn't hurt, a lot of people don't enable. I, I, was, I was disappointed that I didn't see, I don't see this enabled in more distributions because it causes no overhead. Uh, so the scheduling latency tracer is a way to see wake up latencies, it's default things. But even though today we have histograms that actually uh, you could do this now, it makes this tracer obsolete, but that's uh, outside the scope of this talk. Um, up here, uh, these are the uh, tracers that detect uh, preemption and interrupt latencies. So if you want to know how long uh, a critical section is that has interrupts disabled or preemption disabled or both disabled, uh, you enable these. Thing is, this does add overhead even when disabled. So I tell people only enable this if you want to debug your system, but don't make it in production because it will add a noticeable, it's not huge, maybe one, two percent uh, overhead, but it is measurable. 
the hist triggers is kind of like what I said about uh, that. Um, the histogram triggers you can actually now pick any two events, trace events, and make a um, latency from or find out the latency from it using the histogram triggers. Uh, there's a lot of documentation in the kernel, and I plan on giving a talk about. I think I'm giving a talk about this in Open Source Summit or something. I don't know. Uh, in the future, I'll be giving a talk about how you could do this with almost any event. It doesn't have to be wake up latency. It could be any any uh, uh, events, and also you can measure like maybe two different fields of an event. So basic real time stuff. Um, so in your when you do your real time um, development, uh, how many people actually try work or write any real time applications? Some people. Okay, good. So everyone here should know this. That 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 writes real time. Those, those raise your hands. So this should be a, you know review. Um, mlock all. That's the first thing you do. Um, who here doesn't know what mlock all is? Wait, you put your hand up for uh, real time. <laughs> I'm glad you came to this talk. <laughs> okay, a real time application doesn't want any non deterministic behavior, and one of the biggest uh, non-deterministic behavior that uh, any operating system does is page faults. Uh, you, when, you load a or when you load an application in the kernel, you say, okay, execute something like Firefox or whatever. It doesn't load the entire Firefox into memory. God, if it did, every time you type Firefox, you'd have to wait 10 minutes before it would uh, start. So it does it lazily. It will just say, okay, I'm going to, when I execute the code, so it just, that would have been bad. Okay, I'm going to be awake now. Um, anyway, the, uh, when you load up Firefox and it starts running, as it executes the code, it will fault in the pages as it hits it. So it doesn't pull in all the text. So you just, when you say start Firefox, um, the kernel will say, okay, here's Firefox and it sets up the page tables just to say we know or we set up the VM areas saying, okay, we know that this address space in your c computer maps to this file. That's all it says. It doesn't do actually, it doesn't actually map it in. So when you go to execute, the first thing it does when it runs, it takes a page fault. Then the page fault handler says, oh, this memory that you try to access has nothing there. It's just, you know, oh, this address is attached to no memory, no nothing. What, what should we do? So, oh, it's over here. It's just mapped to this file. So let's pull in that file, put it into some memory, so into the physical memory, and then, you know, and then you execute, and then you hit the next page, boom, you hit the next page fault. And that pulls in, do that again. So it's basically only pulls into memory from the file what you execute. Very reasonable, and it's actually fast. Very non-deterministic. Now, I always tell people, determinism and performance are almost inversely proportional. The faster you do something, the less deterministic it is. In fact, there are certain hardware companies that did things so focused on performance. <laughs> it's basically totally impossible to do anything deterministic unless you want to do something on the side channel. <laughs> we won't go there. Anyway, so <laughs> mlock all is a way to say, I got these pages uh, that I'm going to use, I'm going to execute. I don't want to be pulling them in random at random locations. So you can actually tell, if you take mlock all, don't do mlock all on uh, Firefox, but it will actually pull in all the memory and it'll lock it into, it'll map the memory from the address space into memory so you don't take any page faults. So you can run that. And you can trace and make sure that happens. Uh, the thing about, I always tell people, real time is hard. Uh, not just hard real time, but real time is hard. And people who say, oh, I want, I'll just add a real time kernel and everything's real time. I said, no. You have to still understand what the system is. There's a lot of things you have to understand about. CPU affinity is another thing that you have to worry about. Migration hurts you. Migrate every time you, if your task is running on one CPU and it moves to another CPU, or another core that maybe it has a different caches and everything else, it's everything's going to change and it, it could cause a huge latency that you won't expect. So pinning task onto CPU and knowing exactly what is running on that CPU with that task, you could then actually do statistics and um, figure out how cache lines are going to be affected. Uh, and then that's why I also say usually turn off uh, hyperthreading. Uh, if you have, you know, uh, a single core running two tasks, which is basically what hyperthreading is, um, you'll have a lot of effects on when something's going to be executed or not. So turn off hyperthreading, 
pin tasks to core. This is what you really want true deterministic behavior at the most you can get. Uh, priori priority inheritance mutex. Uh, this helps prevent priority inversion. Um, who here does not know what priority inversion is? I'm just curious. Uh, so, ooh, or who's if was afraid of raise their ha hand? Good. Um, so, priority inversion by itself is not bad. In fact, you can't prevent it. Uh, priority inversion will always happen on pretty much any system. What priority inversion is, is basically when one task needs to run, the highest priority task needs to run, it must wait for a task that is of lower priority. So that is a priority inversion. That's okay. That happens all the time. What we don't want is unbounded priority inversion. So unbounded priority inversion means that there's no, you can't guarantee when the high priority task will be able to run while waiting for the low priority task. That's unbounded, and that's what we want. So priority inheritance works, and we actually, this is from the real-time kernel. They actually got the priority inheritance in the kernel, so now prior the, if you run a mutex from, or a futex or whatever, from a mainland pthread mutex, with a set the attribute for the pthread mutex uh, with that attribute, uh, it will have priority inheritance. Right now, Linux kernel doesn't have priority inheritance for the blocks inside the kernel without the RT patch. That's coming. So, I always, I, I tell people, I never give a real-time talk without showing these slides. I wrote this, uh, this slide actually wrote in 2007 when I talked about the internals of the real-time patch at Ottawa Linux Symposium, and I've used it for every real-time talk since. So, this is the basic idea. By the way, uh, I think it was the Mars probe that ran it, uh, that crashed into, uh, or no, it almost crashed. No, what, it didn't crash, it almost crashed. Not the, not the probe that had the m miscalculation, not that one. But no, I think uh, the, the Mars rover, um, it actually locked up on the way to Mars. Hmm? Pathfinder. Was it Pathfinder? Pathfinder. Was it? Yeah. The, yeah. The Pathfinder. Yeah. Well, it was. A, it was. A, it was basically. If you read about it, um, it's a really interesting article to read. Uh, it's. Um, <coughs> it was a priority inversion uh, because of some uh, uh, feature that was going on that. Basically, you know, it locked up, and I think what they did was they figured, they analyzed everything, they figured out what was wrong, they uh, rebooted the, um, hey, I got a plumber's heating or something going on. They rebooted the um, uh, the machine, and then they just turned off the lower priority task that was going to mix with the higher priority tasks, and that's how they fixed it. Uh, anyway, so basically, you have three tasks. You have a high priority task A. Uh, and a really low priority task, C. And B is a priority, a task between the two. It has a two priority. So it's higher priority than C, but lower priority than A. But A and C share a resource. So when C is running, and it grabs a lock, and then A wakes up and starts running, and now it tries to grab the same lock that C has, it blocks. And then C starts to run. Fine. There's your priority inversion right there. Technically. Now B wakes up and preempts C and it runs. And let's just say B will not stop until A tells it to. Do you see a problem there? So a prior priority inheritance, what that means is when A blocks on C, C will inherit the priority of A. So now it's running at the priority of A. So when B wakes up, B can't preempt C because it's got A's priority. And as soon as it lets go of the lock, it loses its priority. A wakes up, grabs the lock, goes, and then it wakes up, B and whatever, or tells it goes to sleep, and then B goes and runs. So, <coughs> setting up your machine. There's several things that uh, RT gives you to shoot yourself in the foot. Uh, it's a dangerous beast. Uh, it's to make everything deterministic and give you full control of your machine. That also means you have full control of your machine to destroy it. Um, but knowing your system really helps. So first thing you do is you want to look at the interrupts. Now with uh, the real-time patch, and w it's in mainline now too, that you can actually run pretty much your interrupts as threads. Uh, it does, like when interrupt goes off, it wakes up, it will, uh, the interrupt will actually, the, back, the real interrupt handler goes off and then it wakes up a thread. And the thread is actually, so the interrupt handler is actually running as a thread. Um, 
and the, own, the normal interrupt handler just wakes up that thread. And when you run real time, if you're running with a real time kernel, and you do PS grep IRQ, you'll see like the first four is I have, this is four CPU machine I have running this, and the rest you'll see all the threads uh, describing what they are even, uh, what they are, you can see them. Uh, for so the first four are uh, KSoft IRQD, which runs as a normal priority. And then um, you have all the interrupt threads. Now, if you want to see what the uh, yeah. if you want to see what the priority is, uh, you could do this little. I just did a little script here. Did a chrt to um, that shows you um, the priority of every task. The first four being the uh, uh, what we just had, right? Is that what we have? Yeah. The first four is showing you the uh, case soft IRQD, which is just a normal task that runs with every other task. Doesn't have any priority, um, but the uh, Interrupts by de default go at priority 50 out of 100, you know, from a zero, well, I guess 100 is the highest or 99 is the highest. The interrupt threads run at 50. You can modify these. These are normal threads. You can do whatever you want. You can modify them. Uh, but the affinity is kind of strange, too, with this. So if we want to look at what the, uh, the CPU affinity of each of these tasks, if I just do here, it's kind of random. It looks, uh, obviously, one, this, um, they are masks, so it's not on CPU two. It's you know the it says CPU when it says one up there it means CPU zero, two means one, you know four, three. So here's the masks that we do, and uh, if you want to see what the affinities of the interrupts are, you it's in slash proc slash IRQ star you know SMP affinity. You can see uh, all these. The max is um, F, which the four CPUs. And so let's say I want to change them all to CPU 0. So I went here and echoed 1, a mask of 1, which is CPU 0, into each of these. And then I looked at it. And you notice uh, it changed most of the affinities. Some of them are hard-coded, so those won't change. In fact, I'll get I, what I left out of this uh, printout or the screenshot was the error messages saying it was trying to modify a non-modifiable you know, mask. But you'll see, you see the few Fs there that means that those were the ones that are not modified. And then I went and said, looked, and it doesn't look much different than before. I'm like, what's going on here? I mean, the first four are still the uh, case soft IRQDs. Those won't change, and that's not what I'm looking at. So let's try something different. Let's put it to CPU 1. And I did a look at it. And here, now you can't tell what's really different from just looking at a screenshot, so I'll make it look, I'll show you. It's, here's the previous. There's the two. So some of them changed. But not all of them changed. And I'm like, why? Well, the way the thread, the, this, is this, this is the threads, the affinities of this interrupt threads. So I'm just telling you, how, telling you how this works inside the kernel. It's implementation detail. Shouldn't change, because we've been using this. It's been using this way for some time. When an interrupt goes off, like when you change the affinity of an interrupt, it doesn't change the thread affinity until the interrupt goes off, and then it goes to wake up that thread and says, oh, We've moved. So it changes the affinity when the interrupt goes off. So if an interrupt never goes, if you're looking at this and saying, why is this affinity of the thread never changing? Although I changed the interrupt, affini the affinity of the interrupt here, is because it won't change until that interrupt actually triggers. So I have a lot of interrupts in here that just never triggered, so those will stay, the affinities of the threads will never change because they never needed to. So it's done it as a as needed basis. So that's just a little FYI. So as I said, you know, real time is, more than just a kernel, you want to check your hardware. You want to make sure your hardware isn't going to cause you latencies. Um, you need to worry about the system management interrupts, SMIs, which are usually what is the bias will do th strange things. Uh, they'll do I mean, various things I've seen, uh, like on a, C on a laptop. Most laptops have a bunch of SMIs going off, and usually it's because the thermal controls of your laptop to control, because it's very complex to get high speed from your laptop in such a small contained area that, well, you guys are embedded developers, you know all this. Uh, it's got to do a lot of uh, configurations. So the BIOS actually has software that does this, and it doesn't worry, it doesn't really give the, uh, uh, what's it called, the uh, operating system, doesn't trust the operating system, so it says, I'm going to do it myself. So it does throws off an SMI, which stops the operating system. SMI operating system has no control over SMIs. This is, of course, Intel architecture. I'm sure other architectures, I'm, I'm focusing on Intel right now. and it stops the architecture and does like, checks the thermal controls, changes fan speeds and all that, and then continues on. And that could take some time. And I mean, one time we found this one uh, SMI that took, 
um, 200 microseconds. On a, it was on a large CPU system, uh, like had, uh, I think it was 32 CPUs. And all CPUs stopped for um, 200 microseconds every 11 minutes. And we had to go back and forth with uh, the vendor. I'm not going to say who they are. <laughs> until they finally uh, said, oh yeah, we are doing an ECC sweep of all the memory. <laughs> so how do we find this? Well, we ran the hardware latency detector. So uh, trace command, by the way, is, my, is the front end to ftrace. So if you just type, you download, it's hopefully shipped there. We're doing more. But you do trace command, start, dash P means you know, it's plugin, but it's really tracer. Uh, HWLAP, and then show, and it shows you the output. And here, you know, on this thing, um, this is actually a real-time kernel, and this is what I got. Uh, th that's in microseconds. I'm like, wow. <laughs> that's like almost a 10 microsecond latency. <laughs> What type of hardware was this? Well, I cheated. I did this on my guest VM. <laughs> so it wasn't SMI. It was just me doing some stuff in the background on my host. <laughs> and uh, I said, I, I just wanted to force, because on my machine, actually, machines I have actually have very low, and there was nothing impressive. So I needed something that really showed it. OK. Now, uh, no hertz full. Uh, it's something else. OK. Everyone's familiar with uh, no hertz? Okay, who's not familiar with no hertz? Okay, I'll, I'll explain no hertz. Uh, and this is actually something that came in from the real-time patch. The real-time patch did it, and it was as um, at the end of the keynote, Thomas Gleichner at uh, Linux Plumbers mentioned that he, you know, Linus wanted no hertz, but didn't care about high-resolution timers. Thomas wanted high-resolution timers. He cared, but and he was the one writing no hertz. So what he did was he gave Linus a patch set saying, no hertz depends on high resolution timers. <laughs> and Linus said, okay, I know what you're doing, but okay. <laughs> That's how high resolution timers got in. What no hertz is, is uh, normal Linux way back when, before no hertz, has a um, hertz value. HZ, if you go in, you say HZ, it usually defaults to like 100, which means 100 hertz. Uh, so every 100 times a second, a tick goes off. And that tick is considered a jiffy. And sometimes for some people who want more higher precision, you higher the ticks. So you make it 1,000 uh, you know, hertz. And this is the whole thing. It was in the config option. You say 1,000 no hertz, or no, sorry, 1,000 hertz. And now 1,000 times a second, you know, every millisecond, you get a tick. What that is, an interrupt goes off, and the timer checks, OK, Let's do all the timing accounting. This is how when you do uh, when you run your um, time on a, on a uh, uh, application, you say time something, and it gives you the user and real time and system time. All that is calculated through this tick that goes on. It's calculating all the accounting stuff like that. Well, then what happens is you get data centers that are mostly idle machines, and it's waking up a thousand times a second because they want a high resolution, whatever. That's a lot of work to do on an idle machine. And the more you wake a CPU up, the less, like, the less uh, it gets to save and have energy. So if you want to conserve stuff, you want the CPU to go into a very uh, low energy state because that way you save on battery power and you also save on electricity bills. But if you have this tick going off while the machine's idle, it causes the CPU to stay at a high state and burn a lot of electricity. So what no hertz is, just config no hertz, says if I'm going idle, turn off the tick and just set a timer. And when you, the CPU wakes up, it goes and says, OK, so many ticks happened. And it will go and do all the calculations at that moment. Why do all these calculations on an idle machine when the CPU is doing nothing? And now the CPU gets into really deep states. Uh, and you say you get better battery performance on Linux. You get um, data centers that are uh, saving that. So there's a really push for this no hertz. Everyone, if you don't have no hertz on, you shouldn't, unless you're real time. You actually might want to turn off no, uh, no hertz on real time, because uh, we are doing cyclic tests, which is cyclic test is, a, is our measurement of latency. It's on jitter. So what cyclic test is? What cyclic test does was it will um, have a um, it will go to sleep, and then when it wakes up, it says okay. Take a timestamp and compare it to when I woke up, when I actually woke up, to when I wanted to wake up and measure the, jip, the, the, um, the delta, which is the jitter. And 
One time we were running this, and everything was great. I mean, I was running Hackbench, getting the machine really ex uh, excited, and I'm doing this, I'm getting great uh, performances. And then one time I just said, let's do this. I like put the machine idle and set the, um, the tick, because the, uh, the, the period of this was every 250 microseconds I had, but I changed it to maybe like one second. Just out of kick, so we're just doing something. I put it one second, and with uh, basically an idle box, and latencies dropped up to almost, a, uh, shot up to almost a millisecond. I was like, what the heck? This is a full real-time kernel, boom, 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 everything else. The CPU went in such a deep sleep, sleep that when the interrupt went off, it took f the CPU forever to wake up, it, almost a millisecond to wake up and execute. <laughs> so there's a gotcha there that you would not expect, so be careful about that. <laughs> anyway, that's no hertz. No hertz full is a real-time thing that you know the high-performance people w really like, because some people consider real-time or you know, latency anytime this, the kernel does anything. It says it's I don't want the kernel doing anything. I want to create a task that runs in user space, spinning on some memory-mapped uh, I/O, and it's going to monitor it. So when a networking packet comes in, I'm going to get it immediately. So they're looking down like sub-microsecond latencies, and they just want the CPU. But if the the system does anything, a tick or whatever, it's going to make that latency much larger. Uh, this is actually, m the people I really like this are the trading people, because the traders, they really want to be the first one to get that trade. Um, so the no hertz doesn't work on anything that's running. It only works with idle. So no hertz full is saying, you know, if you have a single task running, why do you care about a tick? Ticks is mostly done for calculation. You could always, only when you're in the kernel do you really care about the tick. You could do the calculation in once you get to the kernel. And you can, <coughs> you don't need scheduling ideas. So if you go into user space, why don't we just turn off the tick? And this way, you could allow user space to spin like crazy. So I'm like, okay, let me try playing with this. Um, Frederick Weisbecker, who gives a talk here, I don't know if he's giving a talk here, this, but he's, g been, he's giving talks at Kernel Recipes. And he's, he was the main developer of this. And for a while there, it we got rid of almost everything, but there were still some things that were causing problems. So I said, okay, I'm gonna set my command line. I just picked, I had four CPU, or I don't know if I had four or eight CPUs, I can't remember on this for example, but I said, okay, for two and three, at the time I was, I have two and three, I could have just said two, but I put two and three because it was already there. And then I put RCU no, call, no callbacks two or three. This is on the kernel command line. I'm not gonna explain what RCU is here. I, talk to me later, I'll do that later. And there's actually, kernel recipes will have a nice talk by uh, Joel Fernandez will be giving a talk on RCU, so stick around for current recipes and you'll uh, learn everything you want to know about RCU. Anyway, RCU is kind of like a garbage collector, and um, it does a lot of, uh, so when you do something with RCU, like a RCU callback, it's going to later on, it will garbage collect and run, and what this says, RCU no callbacks, means that on two and three, I don't want that garbage collector running on those two CPUs. I want you to do, push them to something else. So. One of the other CPUs will handle the garbage collection for CPU two and three. So I've said ISO CPUs, which is saying I don't want anything scheduled on this these on this CPU, and I want no RCU callbacks on this. So, and then I had this user program uh, user spinner that actually Frederick wrote, and then I said, okay, let's use Kernel Shark. So I recorded um, 30 seconds of user spinning, <coughs> and uh, that's the command I used up there. And I said, okay, I want to use the function graph tracer because the function graph tracer traces inside the kernel like all functions. Max depth of one tells me I only want to get the first function. I don't care about call graphs. I don't care about thing. I want to see any time the, um, a user space program goes into the kernel. So that function graph max depth of one, which I actually wrote max depth of one per specifically for testing the um, no hertz full code. Uh, then the dash M is a mask. I said a four, which is CPU two. I said I'm only want, I only want to trace CPU two. I don't care about any other CPUs. And then I, the task set dash C is the normal, you know, okay, run this guy on CPU four, two. So remember, uh, ISO CPUs means it won't schedule anything on, C on those CPUs, but if you want something on there, you gotta specifically set it to run there. So task set dash C two says, tells me, Run this. Run the user spinner on CPU two. So it sets the affinity and runs it. And each one of those little ticks that you see up there is a kernel event. And in that thirty second time frame, there's a lot of kernel events. So I took my mouse and zipped in there, and boom, I got zoomed in. 
And I looked in there and can't really see it. I was hoping it'd be better resolution. It was the interrupt handler. And I'm like, okay, oops. Um, I didn't, all my, I, I didn't cap this, but what I found out was all the interrupt handlers still, although you do ISO CPUs, it doesn't move interrupts. So I actually had to go through and, okay, echo F3, which is to say, move everything off that. All the, my, I had interrupts on those CPUs. So those, back here, all those ticks, that's a bunch of interrupts going off. So I did it and ran it again. It got a lot better. Looks pretty good there. And I checked it, that's about four seconds. And at Plumbers, I mentioned this, and Thomas said, uh, did you turn off the watchdog? Whoops. Okay, so I turned off the watchdog because I found out it was a watchdog happening. So still had it. I said, what the heck? <laughs> What's going on? So I zoomed in there, and back here you can see, I look at this vector, I was looking at the, the trace event, and yeah, that's the trace event I found was uh, call function entry. So I looked where trace, the trace event for call function entry was, and I saw that, okay, these, th this is being hit. Why is it being hit? And then I looked at the code within it, this generic SMP function call interrupt. I'm like, okay, let's see what that is. So now I, I ran it with dash G, which now is, means graph it. I don't care about any other function, but I want to see this function and what it's calling. So dash G, and I looked at it, and inside there I saw no hertz full kick. I'm like, wait, what the heck? So I did this stack, I said, okay, let's record this tracing and see the no hertz full, uh, or the, this, and see where the no hertz full kick is and what's happening is a time interrupt. And the time interrupt is this function here, clock source watchdog. I'm like, well, wait, I turned off watchdogs. What the heck this is? Well, I found out that this code is something that the TSC is unstable. It runs this to try to keep it. S so the hardware was saying, okay, it's on uh, TSC is not stable. So, <coughs> Um, <laughs> I, I put in TSC equals reliable. In other words, I lied. <laughs> I like, I don't care. Just tell this, this thing. And boom, I put FF to see everything. No events. Thank you. <laughs> I'll, time for questions? I don't know. That was only 58 slides. I was, I was low on that. Where's the I'm a rugby player, I know how to throw. Oh. There you go. Yeah. Um, so is there any reasoning to schedule interrupts when you isolate the CPUs on them or is it is it is it an idea to change that? Because it surprises me as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Patch is accepted. Your patch is accepted, that's awesome. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually, no, that's, uh, it shocked me as well. I'm like, why don't we do that by this? Actually, if I understand correctly, especially since we're being recorded, I think, uh, I think we're trying to go for CPU sets and uh, obsolete ISO CPUs, uh, because you could do things with CPU sets that, so they're saying you don't need ISO CPUs, but ISO CPUs are so much easier than CPU sets. But, you know, I, a lot of people are saying they want to go CPU sets and just learn them. So that's probably why. Okay, thank you.